Okay, this will be the lecture for chapter 30, and now we're going to start to talk about light emission. And I'm going to start to talk about some things that maybe you didn't know or maybe you weren't uh, aware of. I'm going to talk about how we can get atoms excited and how they can emit and absorb certain colors, and that's a fancy word for a spectra. I'll talk a little bit about incandes in incandescence and fluorescence. I'll also talk about absorption spectra, which is going to be the reverse of emission spectra. I'll talk about phosphores phosphorescence. Um, I'll talk about uh, various lamps, and we'll finish off with lasers. So let me start off by telling you something that you don't already know. Suppose I had a box, and I were to fill this box with hydrogen gas, and if I were to excite this gas by some means, could be voltage, it could be some electrons, um, some type of energy, if I were to pump some energy into this gas, then what it's going to do is it's going to put off some colors. It's going to put off some reds, it's going to put off some blues, and it's going to put off some violets, but this gas, and I'll just say that it's hydrogen because it's the easiest gas to talk about, it's only going to put off certain colors, certain wavelengths. Now, the reason I say you probably don't know this is because our eyes can't perceive these colors. We would add them together and we would just see like white light or, you know, orange light or something like that. But what really happens is hydrogen is going to put off some violets, some um, indigos, some blues, some light blues, some cyans, and some reds, but only these colors. So only certain wavelengths would be emitted by this um, excited hydrogen gas. Now, if I were to shine some white light into this hydrogen, so if I were to go ahead and not talk about energy, but let me just say if I were to shine white light, all colors of um, the rainbow into this hydrogen, it turns out that it's going to selectively absorb those same exact colors, but none of the other colors, none of the other wavelengths. So it, it would absorb that one, and that one, and that one, and this one, and this one. The rest of the light would actually go ahead and make it through the hydrogen gas. So you can kind of see how all this stuff lines up. Now, we have special names for this. We say this is what hydrogen is going to absorb. It's the absorption spectra. And this is what hydrogen is going to emit. It would be the emission spectra. Now, different elements are actually going to preferentially absorb or emit certain colors, certain frequencies, certain wavelengths. I talked about hydrogen, and I said hydrogen is going to emit um, certain colors. You can see that color right here, this color right here. And there's some over here that we really can't quite see. But if we were to take helium and put that guy into a box and excite it, so maybe now I'm going to have some helium here, that's going to preferentially absorb and emit certain colors, but different colors. So this one, you can kind of see that there's a yellow here, there's a red right here, not the same red as that one. You can kind of see lines here, there's a very faint one here, and so on and so forth. This is kind of like the fingerprint of helium, if you will. And we all know that everyone's fingerprint is different than everyone else's. The spectral signature from different gases are going to be unique. If we were to do carbon, you can kind of see that carbon's going to have a yellow here that neither of those ha guys have, this one. And you see a bunch of lines scattered throughout here. Um, same thing with oxygen. If I were to put oxygen in a um, chamber and excite it, then I'm going to see all these lines kind of scattered throughout here. So these are the emission spectra of a whole bunch of gases, and what we're going to talk about in this particular chapter is, is why do these guys look different? Now, the reason why these guys actually look different comes back to chapter 11 when we talked about um, the structure of the atom. Um, I said that atoms are positively charged nucleuses, and they're going to have these orbits. And electrons tend to live in these orbits, and I said that they can only live in certain orbits. They cannot live in other orbits. Um, we actually call these um, orbits discrete, and if we were in a chemistry class, we would actually say that these are electron shells. So this would be the first electron shell, this would be the second electron shell, and then there could be one out here that would be the third electron shell, and so on and so forth. Now, it turns out that there's energy involved with these shells. And what we could kind of do is we kind of could do is we could say this would be the first energy state, this would be the second energy state, and this would be the third energy state. We actually say that these things have to be discrete. They have to live at these certain orbits and only certain orbits. 
The fact that they are discrete is another way of saying that these guys live in quantum states, where quantum means it has to be in one or two or three. It can't live, say, right here. That's not possible. Now, when an electron jumps between these states, what it's doing is, is it's um, getting or losing energy. So if I wanted to take this electron and move it up to this state right here, it's going to take some energy. This energy state has um, a higher energy than this state does. Conversely, when the electron hops from right here down to right here, it's going to lose some energy. And when it loses some energy, actually it's going to put off some light. And we could actually talk about light absorption when we go in this direction. And we could talk about light emission when it goes in this direction right here. Now, if I were to go ahead and draw the energy states, very typically what we do is we draw this state right here. And we would say that this is the ground state. And I would say n is equal to 1. That would be the first electron shell. And then I might draw this one right here, and I would say this is n is equal to 2. That would be the second electron shell that I drew. And then I would draw one right here, and I would say n is equal to 3, and that would be the third electron shell, and so on and so forth. If I had an electron and it lived right here, then it's going to take some energy to move it up into this guy right over there. So it's preferentially going to absorb maybe some light or something. And that light has to correspond directly to this gap. If the light had a different amount of energy, say it had enough energy to make it up to right here, then it's not going to be absorbed. Similarly, if I had an electron that was living up here and it jumped down to right here, then it's going to preferentially emit some light. And that light is going to have the, a very discrete amount of energy. And that's going to correspond to a single wavelength and a single wavelength only. When we talk about different elements, different all elements are going to be different. They're going to have a different number of protons and neutrons and electrons. And so when we look at different elements, then these things may appear at different places. Let's just say the ground state is the same for this guy. If I had a different element, then this might be my n is equal to 2, and this might be my n is equal to 3, and so on and so forth. So different. Um, elements are going to have different structures, hence they're going to have different energy levels and different colors. Now, we actually have a special name for what's going on. We say the atom is becoming excited, and when it spits out the chunk of light at the end, we're going to say that excitation has occurred. So this pretty much says everything that I said, but it's got a pretty picture to go with it. Here we're imparting some energy to an atom, and it's going to make the atom excited. You kind of see the atom is kind of all wobbly-like. And kind of what's going on is we'll probably have some electron out here. And that tends to be not quite all that stable. So the atom has become excited. But then the, the electron wants to move down to the lowest energy state. It wants to move down to this n is equal to 1 state. And when it does that, when the electron makes that jump, then it's going to put off some light. And that light is going to have a very specific wavelength, a very specific frequency, if you will. And then the atom is happy with the electron living back down in the ground state. Now, of course, I'm going to have to give you an equation for this guy, because it's a physics class. Uh, we're not going to use this equation so much in this chapter, but we're definitely, definitely, definitely going to see this one in other chapters. Um, how much energy is available to the light is going to be related to some constant, and technically this is called Planck's constant. The value for this is actually going to be 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 joule seconds. And this right here would be the frequency of the light. Bear in mind that this guy has to be in joules, and this guy has to be in hertz. What this is kind of saying is, suppose I have an atom like this, and we're going to have these states. This would be the ground state, n is equal to 1, n is equal to 2, and n is equal to 3. Suppose that the electron was living up here, and at the end of the day, it wants to move back down into the ground state. This energy difference right here, I'm going to call this a delta E, is going to be related to the frequency of the light, of the chunk of light called a photon, um, that is emitted. And it's going to correspond to this energy difference right here. This one right here would have a larger energy difference, it would have a higher frequency. But bear in mind that these energy differences, and hence the frequencies, are going to be discrete. What that means is the light is going to be monochromatic, and that's a fancy word for saying one wavelength and one wavelength only, or one color and one color only for each one of these jumps. 
the fact that hydrogen puts off certain colors is going to correspond to this jump, or this jump, or this jump. Only certain energies, only certain colors. So now I'll just a quick little check your neighbor question. Which one has less energy per photon? And we have you know all the colors of the rainbow that we can talk about, Roy G, blue, indigo, and violet. One thing to bear in mind is, is don't forget we have UV and we're going to have IR. And in this case right here, the frequency is going up as we work our way from left to right. Which one has less energy per photon? Well, red light is going to have less energy because the frequency is simply lower. And this kind of makes sense. We know that UV can give us sunburn, infrared um, cannot. So higher frequency, higher energy, less, lower frequency, lower energy. What this also kind of means is, is as we work our way up right over here, then we're more likely to stimulate an atom with these higher frequencies, hence the higher energies. Looking at this guy right over here, we could even ask yourself um, which one is which color, and that's kind of my next question. Which one is red light and which one is blue light? Well, something that we know is, is here we have lots of energy. Here, we don't have as much energy. The jump is not as big. So this one has higher energy. It should have higher frequency, because as this goes up, this guy is going to go up. And you can even kind of see that this one right here is far more frequent than this one right here. So there's a really good chance that this one right here is blue, and this one right here is red. Now, how do we actually go about um, seeing this? Well, we actually have something called a spectroscope, and all this really is is going to be something with a slit and some lenses and some stuff like that. And we're going to take a source, and we can shine this into our spectroscope. That would be this creature right over here. And don't worry too much about the slits and the lenses. But the important thing is that we're going to have either a prism or a diffraction grating. And we know that these guys are going to work um, through, well, we'll talk about the prism. Let's talk about um, refraction and dispersion. Remember that red bends the least, blue bends the most. And it's going to separate out whatever light this thing is putting out. And it's going to have many different colors. And it's going to make them come out here, here, and here. And we can actually see the lines that are coming out of that. Again, that's going to tell us what source we're looking at. So let me just kind of pop over and show you a quick little simulation of what's going on. Here I have um, one atom, and I'm going to excite it using some electrons. And what you can kind of see is the atom gets kind of excited. That's when it puffs up like a puffer fish. And what's going on is, is the electron is going from the ground state right here up into this state right here. And I'm just going to put a spectrometer right here, and that's kind of measuring the color of light that's coming out of it, and this one's in the far ultraviolet. And what I can do is, is this is how much energy I'm exciting this thing by, and I don't have enough to reach some of the higher orbits. So if I were to I'm gonna speed this thing up a little bit, if I were to increase this guy, I'm going to jack it up all the way, uh, what we can kind of see is now we see that I can pop my electron into the second, third, fourth, fifth, ex um, and so on and so forth excited state. And what's going to happen is, as this electron makes the various jumps, then it's going to put off various colors. So you can kind of see when it goes from 3 to 2, it's putting off kind of a reddish light. When it goes from 6 to 2, it's putting off a purplish light. And somewhere in between, it's putting off a cyanish light. And what we're kind of seeing down here build up is we're seeing certain colors, and certain colors only, of this element. And this one is hydrogen. These lines correspond to these energy differences. Energy is going to correspond to frequency, which is a fancy way for saying color. I'll let this run for a little bit. Let's take a quick look at um, what these things actually look like. Here we have hydrogen, mercury, sodium, various gases inside of some tubes. And you can kind of see that here we have hydrogen. It's kind of a bluish purplish. And we're going to have these colors right here. Mercury is going to look far more blue than hydrogen. And you're going to see these colors right here. Sodium is a yellowish. Neon's a reddish. And you're going to see um, just different colored lines. Where do they come from? Well, I'm going to switch my element. I'm going to switch this one to Mercury. And what I want you to pay attention to is where these um, guys are. So let me switch over to Mercury. You can see that Mercury has different energy levels. And these different energy levels are going to correspond to different frequencies or different colors that Mercury is going to put off. Sodium, kind of see, different colors. Neon, different colors. Right, and different energy levels. And actually, we don't have enough energy to really excite this particular element. 
again, what this boils down to is, is the energy levels. The jump is going to correspond to Planck's constant and frequency. Again, make sure you have that, not so much for this chapter, but for future ones. And we're going to see certain colors from hydrogen, certain colors from sodium, helium, neon, mercury. The fingerprints of the elements, if you